proteins work is never done. So right now we're going to be talking about the four levels of protein structure. So our goal is to describe the actual four, four levels of protein structure and explain the environmental conditions that denature proteins. Okay, so we're going to start with the levels of protein structure and then talk about denaturing. What denature really means is that um, they lose their structure. And when something loses its structure, it also loses its function. So if it was a structural protein for your hair, your hair is not going to be feeling so great. Or if it was needed for your skin or your eyes, suddenly those are not going to be working so wonderful. Or if it's for your metabolism, something's going to be wrong. Okay. So our four, level of, four levels of protein structure, then we'll talk about denaturation. So first level, first thing you should think about when you're thinking about proteins is amino acids. This is called the primary structure. It's abbreviated as one with a degree sign. And this is the sequence of amino acids. Amino acids, and remember that goes from N terminus from the amino side to the C terminus on the acid side. So that's the order that we read them in. And that's extremely important because the way that these amino acids are arranged in the order that they flow in is important for the second level or secondary structure. Secondary structure, abbreviated as two with a degree sign, is actually two or threefold, depending on how you want to look at it. That involves loops. That involves alpha helices. That's the plural. The singular is alpha helix. And this also involves beta strands, beta sheets. Okay, and so these, this is really kind of based on hydrogen bonding in the backbone. And when I say backbone, when I'm talking about proteins, that's every part of the amino acid that's not the R group. The R group's called the side chain. That's what we care about. That's the sequence of amino acids, that's side chain. Everything else that N, C alpha, C double bond O, that's part of the backbone. That's the part that repeats. That's the repeatable part. So in our backbone, that's going to be between the carbonyl group and the NH group. So this is going to be able to form hydrogen bonds with that. But that's only if... Um, so if we're able to form those hydrogen bonds in a close area, it forms alpha helices, which look like this. They look like loop-de-loops. If it's far, far, far away interactions, we abbreviate it like this with an arrow, beta strands. And um, it kind of makes it lay flat, makes the protein lay flat a little bit. And then loops, they don't have any interactions really. So those side chains are hindering the hydrogen bonds from being able to form because in order to form a hydrogen bond, it has to be close enough to interact. So loops have no definitive structure. So that's when I said they're secondary. It has two. It's really alpha helix is definitive. Beta strands is definitive. Loops is really no structure, no H bonds. Okay. So as you would imagine, the secondary is based on the primary structure, the sequence of the amino acids. That really helps its ability to form the hydrogen bonds, which are the basis for secondary structures. The third level, primary, secondary, tertiary. Oh, this is not writing well. I didn't know that online pens could run out of ink, tertiary. And that's abbreviated three with a degree sign. And what this is, oops, is the three, oh, I'm having huge problems. Pardon me for one second. It's a 3D structure. Okay, there we go. 3D structure. It's working fine now. Okay, and so this is based on 
all the total interactions between the alpha helices and the beta strands. So this is more hydrogen bonding. And this also involves the burying of hydrophobic. So this word means water fearing. So that would also mean nonpolar amino acids. So some of those amino acids don't like water. So they're going to end up on the inside of the protein away from all the water. When we're thinking about our cells, our cells are about 80% water, 60 to 80%. Um, so everything on the outside is going to be water. And if there's any pockets on the inside where chemistry happens, maybe it called an active site, that's, that's all going to be coated with water. So those were the hydro, that would be where hydrophilic amino acids go, water loving. But the, these hydrophobic interactions, they're going to bury against each other. So those are going to be large, they're going to be aromatic, they're going to be mostly hydrocarbons. So the hydrocarbons get buried. Also, we're going to have some hydrogen bonding. Oh, if I could scroll down. Hydrogen bonding in the uh, between the alpha helices and beta strands. So we're going to have some additional hydrogen bonds here that hold this all together. And if we're to draw this, so maybe we've got some strands and loops and helices are going to be held together. Um, with hydrogen bonds or salt ion ion interactions, intra, um, intramolecular forces. There we go. So, those types of interactions would give an overall 3D shape. And maybe this would go behind that other thing and far away. Okay, and we're going to practice this in class too, don't worry. Okay, and then the fourth level, which is optional. So some proteins only need tertiary structure and then they are done. They can function perfectly. Some proteins need a fourth level called quaternary. And that's abbreviated for with a degree sign. And what this is, is this is the interaction of two or more protein chains, of two plus protein chains. So two more three, two or more three D proteins can cause quaternary structure. Some don't need it; they're totally active at tertiary. Some need quaternary. An example of something that needs quaternary structure is hemoglobin found in your blood, it needs four chains in order to react. So if you see that it's got multiple chains, it's quaternary. So I'm just going to draw the proteins like a blob. So this is chain one, this is chain two, that could be a quaternary structure of something. Hemoglobin actually looks like this. One, two, three, four. I'm such a beautiful artist. I'm going to label it like this is chain A. This is chain B, and and so each one of these is like the appropriate like protein structure that it is. Okay, and then they interact together. These are typically ion-ion um, interactions. This could be hydrophobic burying. This could also be hydrogen bonding, and that's what keeps these together. And this is based on the 3D shape, the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is based on the secondary structure. Secondary structure is based on the primary structure. And they're all extremely important. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about here is I believe that we've hit, yeah, we've described the four levels of protein structure. Three of those are required. One, one, two, and three are required. Four is optional. Explain environmental conditions that denature proteins. So what denaturation means is it basically takes these proteins and breaks them down. So if it had quaternary structure, let me change my colors again. So if we're denaturing, 
it loses its structure. And if it loses its structure, it loses its function. So that would make us sad and our proteins wouldn't work anymore. And there's certain environmental conditions that can cause this. Because if we look at these interactions, it was pretty much, we saw like these three like repeating over and over and again, especially in tertiary and quaternary. Ion-ion interactions, that's between a plus and a minus. Hydrophobic, that's nonpolar with nonpolar. So that would be London dispersion forces. And hydrogen bonding, so that would be um, a polar H interacting with something else. Um, maybe something like that. Okay, so the way that all of these can be disrupted is if we change the ion state. If suddenly, instead of interacting with this oxygen, which is slightly negative, it interacts with a full negative charge, it breaks that hydrogen bond. So there's a couple ways we can do that. So the first is by adding salt. Salt will destroy the ion-ion interactions, and the hydrogen bonding interactions. Another is pH, because remember, pH, we're looking at concentration of H+. Plus. That's an ion. So any salt, this is going to completely ionize. This is also an ion. So again, that's going to destroy ion-ion interactions. That's going to destroy H bonding. And then to get rid of the hydrophobic, and it will actually get rid of all of these, is temperature. So that's why when patients are running fevers of higher than 104, it's really, really a big deal because you're denaturing the proteins. Suddenly their metabolism's not working. Suddenly their brain's not working. Their skin's deteriorating. Their organs are deteriorating. It's a really big deal. And so the way that temperature works is that this is measuring the average kinetic movement, average movement of molecules. So when these things start wiggling a whole bunch, they start acting more like gases. And as we know, gases don't really have intermolecular forces. So more like a gas, which will destroy the ion-ion interactions, the hydrophobic interactions, and the H bonding because there is so much movement that it cannot possibly keep those bonds together and keep the correct structure. So that's really how and why those environmental conditions can really destroy proteins, really destroy a patient. So too much salt, bad. Uh, extreme pHs, Bad. Temperature, bad.